we've got Maria Sweater, uh, who is going to go first. She's uh, one of our uh, ECFA <coughs> award winners this year, and we're very pleased to hear what she did with her money. So, uh, she is a PhD as an assistant <coughs> professor here at UMKC in the School of Science and Engineering, Division of Biological and Biomedical Systems. She grew up in northern Wisconsin and graduated with distinction <coughs> with a Bachelor of Science degree in Botany and Molecular Biology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 2003. She received her PhD in Biological Sciences from Stanford University in 2010, where she worked with Professor Dr. Lee Quinn Lo, hope I'm saying that correctly, studying the development of wiring specificity in the olfactory system of D. Melangaster. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> um, exploring the function of the longitudinal lacking, uh, which is called LOLA, transcription factor, and publishing a landmark study in on the diversity of local interneurons in the antennal lobe. <clears throat> she then moved to moved as a postdoc to Munich, Germany, to study muscle development at the laboratory of Dr. Frank Schnorr Schnorner. Schnorner? Schnorner, sure. yeah. <laughs> Putting in an extra M there. At the Max Planck <coughs> Institute for Biochemistry. She published a transcriptomics uh, expression resource uh, tracing development of the Drosophilia flight muscles across eight time points and identified a role for the CELF1 homologue Reno1 in flight muscle specific alternative splicing. We're going to be hearing something about splicing today. Uh, in 2017, she started her own laboratory in the Department of Physiological Chemistry at the Ludwig Maximilius uh, University of Munich, and uh, moved her laboratory back to the USA to UMKC in September of 2022. Her lab studies is the role of alternative splicing in RNA regulation and muscle development using fruit flies as a powerful genetic model. Her group employs genetics, genomics, and biochemistry to investigate <coughs> molecular genetic mechanisms of RNA binding protein function with the goal of understanding how dysregulation of RNA processing contributes to the muscle disease. And I'm sure you'll pronounce all of that much better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Maria. All right, thank you for the introduction. So, um, this is what my lab studies. So this picture are actually of muscle sarcomeres. So if you've never seen one, these are actually the little mini motors that make your muscle contract. Um, and by the end of my talk, hopefully you understand a little bit more about the structure. Um, so first off, thank you very much for the um, award, for the ECFA award. So I used my money to attend the Gordon Research Conference in Myogenesis. Um, which was last June in Luca, Italy. And so this is a view actually. And that hotel right there, that is um, Old Chioco. That's the resort where it's held. And so you can see there's really nothing else around. And so you have a nice week to focus on basically nothing but science. <laughs> it's wonderful actually. And we, we and had drink wine. And, and good food. Yes, very good food, drink wine. Um, <laughs> But this is one of the kind of premier conferences in the muscle development field, and there's a lot of the, the really big names that are there. Um, and it's, it's a very useful meeting to attend. And so I had a talk, actually, my abstract was selected for a talk um, with a long title. You don't have to really read the whole thing because I'm going to talk about basically today, show you what I had talked about then. Um, since then, this story actually has been accepted. The manuscript was accepted, and it's in press at Pulse Biology. Um, I submitted two different grant applications based on this project. One of them, actually, my co-PI was actually at this meeting, which was really useful um, because we got to talk um, and actually kind of work out a lot of basics for the grant that we submitted. Um, and also, I was awarded one of the FFD grants um, together with Dr. Wyckoff from the School of Pharmacy which was using some of the experiments that I kind of thought of when I was actually at the meeting. Um, so I've had quite a few outcomes already from, from the award. Okay, and so the rest of the time, I'm gonna tell you a bit about what I do 
and what is splicing and why we study splicing in muscle. Um, and then give you at the end just a flavor of a few slides of what our type of data actually looks like. And so the first part is going to be pretty basic because I know everybody comes from very broad backgrounds. So muscles. Um, you're probably used to more seeing an arm and are familiar with human muscles. Um, but this basic structure and organization of muscle is actually conserved. So muscles form these bundles. These bundles are all grouped together into fascicles, which are just collections or groups of muscle fibers. And so each of these different fibers here, the light and the dark, um, what that's supposed to denote is that we have different types of muscle fibers. So in humans, broadly, we can categorize these as slow or fast muscle fibers. So slow are things that you use for endurance, like marathon running. Fast fibers are things you use for like sharp, quick, weight-bearing motion, so like lifting weights. Okay, so it's very important actually that we have both types of muscle fibers and our muscle fibers are actually able to adapt. Um, meaning that we can build more slow muscle or more fast muscle, right, if we exercise or do different types of activities. These fibers are built of things that are called myofibrils. And myofibrils are long strings of sarcomeres. Okay, so the sarcomeres are the smallest unit of the muscle. There's actually thousands and thousands of these little motor units that make the muscle contract. Okay, and so what I'm actually interested in is how this structure is built during development and what goes wrong when we talk about muscle diseases. Okay, so this is what a sarcomere actually looks like when you look under an electron microscope. Okay, so you can see it's nice, it's ordered. So we call this the Z-disc in this middle part, the M-line, and you can appreciate that there's all these kind of straight lines in between. Okay, this is a schematic of what you're actually looking at. At the Z-disc, there's actin filaments, these things in red, and at the M line is where you have a bipolar myosin filament anchor. And so myosin is a motor protein that actually binds to and moves along the actin. So the same way you would think of like an engine in a car, right? It has pistons. You can think of the myosin as the pistons. There's also other proteins. So here, this yellow one called Titan, um, which connect the actin to the myosin parts of the sarcomere and actually set how long the sarcomere is. Actually, in humans, this structure is much more complex. It has at least 160 the filament. Um, so this is quite a simplified view. The other thing that makes this a bit more complicated is that each of these different proteins that I'm showing diagrammed here can exist in multiple versions or multiple isoforms. Okay, to understand what isoforms are, I have a simple example. Okay, so what is alternative splicing? Let's consider a simple sentence, so four different elements. Let's eat, comma, kids. Now we can combine those all together and have one meaning for our sentence. Okay, but if we skip one of those elements, we splice it, right? We have a slightly different structure to our sentence and it has a very different meaning. Okay, this basic concept is the same thing that happens biologically. So genes are also made of all of these different individual elements. Okay, so for example, the Titan gene. Due to the splicing process, that means that the proteins that can be produced from this gene also come in different flavors, different varieties, right? And you can appreciate that this one over here has a really short region, and this has a really long, more flexible region. Okay, this version of Titan is actually expressed in the heart. So it's a very short, very stiff protein, and that's necessary actually for your heart to contract properly. Okay, these very long, flexible versions of this protein are expressed more in your skeletal muscles, so like your leg or your arm muscles. This is what allows those muscles to be more flexible and to move much uh, bigger movements, basically, than what your heart is able to move. There's a lot of different human diseases, actually, where you get expression of this isoform instead of these isoforms in heart, and the heart actually contracts too much. It's allowed to move too much. And this leads to the damage and the fibrosis that leads to heart attacks, for example, in different cardiomyopathies, as well as in myotonic dystrophy and a lot of other muscle disorders. So it's really important that a cell decide which of these particular isoforms it's going to express. Okay, and so what my lab actually studies, which you can't read because it's underneath the thing that's on the slide right now, um, my lab actually studies the process of how a muscle decides which of these versions it's going to produce. 
So we studied the regulation of alternative splicing. Okay, and we study this in flies and your supplemental gaster. Okay, so why on earth would you study this question in fly? So actually, flies have muscles. Actually, they do. And those muscles have the exact same structure that the muscles do in our own bodies. The sarcomere, actually, the pictures of the sarcomere I was showing you, those are fly sarcomeres. But you wouldn't really know the difference if I had shown you a human sarcomere. Okay, so they have the same structure, the same organization, and actually all the same proteins that build sarcomeres are the same. Also, the mechanism of contraction, actually, those myosin motor units are exactly the same. But flies have a much shorter life cycle than humans do. So you can generate a lot of flies really quickly to analyze something where you can't really do that with humans. Humans have a limited genetic toolbox. We're not allowed to. Uh, do that with humans, but flies have a very large genetic toolbox. So I have a lot of tools in the fly that I can mutate genes, or I can knock them down, or express them where I want and when I want. Okay, when we talk about humans, we're talking about ones or maybe tens of individuals. Where when I work with flies, I can look at hundreds or thousands of flies. Okay, so this gives me a lot of statistical power. Most work in humans is done actually just in cells. So you isolate one particular type of cell and you work in a culture dish. I actually work in the flat. So I'm working in a whole intact organism. The important is that a lot of the RNA binding proteins, the regulators of splicing that are known to cause human disease are all conserved in flies. But while there's usually four to six copies of all of these genes in humans, there's only one or maybe two copies in flies. This makes it a lot easier to work with these proteins and figure out what they're actually doing. Okay, and this is what my flies actually look like under the microscope. And this is what their muscles look like. We focus mostly on the flight muscles. So these nice, long, there's six fibers that expand across the fly's thorax. And today I'm going to talk about cell, about gluon. And this is what the muscles look like in flies that don't have gluon. You don't have to know much about muscle to appreciate that these flies have a lot of trouble. Their muscles don't actually work right. Okay, so this protein is very conserved. It has the same structure in both humans as well as in flies. Um, and so we use flies as a model to figure out basically what this protein is doing so that we can then hopefully try to apply it to learn more about what goes wrong in human disease. So this protein itself is misregulated in myotonic dystrophy. That's what underlies a lot of the symptoms actually that patients have. So, one of the advantages of flies is that we can go in and we can look at any different point in development of the system, and we can see what is going wrong at each different point. When you're looking at humans, for example, a lot of times you're looking at an adult or even a child who's maybe 10 or 12 years old, right? There's been a lot of development that happened before you actually ever get to look at the sample, right? So we can look in this whole process and see when these things start to go wrong and what are the first things that start to go wrong. When we do this with Bruno, Already at these very, very early stages, before you would even properly consider this a muscle, we see defects. Um, and so this is a staining. This is showing in the top part here what happens in a normal control fly, and this is what happens in our Bruno mutant. And you can appreciate that these structures here are somewhat different from each other. This is the earliest defect that we can actually find in our mutants. Um, this is actually the set of skeleton, the structure of the muscle. And these rearrangements are necessary to actually form those myofibrils and the sarcomeres. And so there's defects in how they're being rearranged that lead to defects in how you actually form the sarcomeres. There's also defects later during this process. So normally you form sarcomeres and then those sarcomeres are built upon and grow to get bigger to reach the, like, the adult version of the sarcomere. Already at these early stages, the sarcomeres aren't put together properly. So here you can see that this sarcomere splits into two when it should just be one unit, like in the control. And then when it starts to grow, this process goes horribly wrong. So there are actually other components of the cell that get incorporated into the middle of the sarcomeres, right? So they're, they're not very intact, they're very loose. We work on splicing. So every single dot in this plot is a single exon, a single unit of a gene. Okay, and the black ones show things that should get turned off during development, 
and other ones that should get turned on. So there's a switch in these isoforms. You have some that are expressed embryonically and some that are expressed in mature muscle. In the Bruno, you can see that this line is flat. That change in splicing doesn't happen. So this is an assay called mRNA-seq, um, and this is basically looking at the molecular level by dissecting out those muscles from the group lice to actually see what's changing. Um, and the consequence of this failed change is that we get those defects in the development of a structure. Okay, and then the last thing I want to illustrate that we can do with flies with how we use these genetic tools um, is that we have a lot of tricks. So we can, for example, put Bruno back only at early stages or only at late stages of development. Okay, in this second example here, this is when we talk about gene therapy. This is what we're actually talking about doing in humans, right? You have a human that actually developed all the way through and it's only at these later stages once you see that there's a problem that you're talking about trying to fix it. Okay, so if we look just at the early stages, okay, if you focus just on these bottom two, the top two are controls, you can actually see if we put Bruno back in the rescue, we don't see much difference to the mutant. So it's not sufficient. We can't just put Bruno back early to fix all the problems. In fact, if we put it back, we make it worse. It's hard to see here with the lighting, but there's actually a hole in the middle of this fiber. And you can appreciate that these look even worse than these little dots here. Okay, so this is what I just showed you at this early point. What about if we do this later, at these later stages? Okay, if you look here at this rescue where we put it back at the later stages, this muscle looks much more intact than if we only had it at the earlier stages. However, although we can see sarcomeres in these, so this is better than just putting it back early, they still don't look like they should. They look more like the mutant. So we're able to partially fix what went wrong. Um, and so what we think is that this shows that gene therapy approaches might be useful, but they're not actually going to be a cure, right? So they're going to maybe help the patients maintain what status they have of being able to use their muscle um, when we make an intervention, but you're not going to get, be able to go back in time and rebuild the system properly from the ground up, which is what you would need to be able to do to help here. Okay, and so what we showed in this paper um, is that Bruno actually controls multiple different processes throughout the development of muscle. It regulates a transition in splicing. The efficiency or toxicity of Bruno expression depends on how high you express it and when you express it during development of the muscle. Um, and being able to restore the expression or the proper expression level of this protein later in development does um, partially rescue the unit. Okay, and these are the people in my lab who did the work. It was started by Ellen and Ganova when I was in Germany. Um, and currently I have um, a PhD student and a postdoc working on this project. Um, and these are all my different resources. And thank you for your attention. For Are you actually uh, doing trials of um, interventions in in patients, real patients? I mean, is I currently or is this am all not. this is all experimental on flies? Right? This is all experimental on flies. Has there been any? People currently are at the point of trying to do it in cells in a dish. Okay. So for myotonic dystrophy in particular, there are no treatments. There are some other muscle diseases where there are new treatments that have come in the market in the last two or three years, actually, mm -hmm. um, for like myotonic dystrophy or for multiple sclerosis, for example, um, where we actually do have some types of technologies. Interestingly, a couple of those were actually tested in flies before they ever went through clinical wow. trials. So That's great. So it's promising for the future, but at least at yes. this point, there's nothing. Yeah. Exactly. It's a model where we can actually use a whole animal to actually test different ideas of what could we potentially sure. do. Sure. Sure. That's awesome.